हरि ओम फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द सेकंड पार्ट ऑफ द सीरीज ऑन हाउ ब्रिटेन स्टोल 45 ट्रिलियन डॉलर्स फ्रॉम भारत और इंडिया ओके सो लेट्स गो ऑन टू द स्लाइड्स सो वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड समथिंग इंपॉर्टेंट एंड आई मेंशन दिस इन द लास्ट एपिसोड दैट देयर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड द कांसेप्ट ऑफ द ड्रेन ऑफ वेल्थ ओके सो दिस वाज प्रोपाउंडेड फर्स्ट बाय दादा भाई नवरोजी um who was obviously an intellectual and very much a part of the british establishment and another proponent of this was uh romesh chandra dutt again a very big scholar and he was an ics or part of the indian civil services and one of the very few indians um in the late 18th and early ni- late 19th and early 20th centuries to rise to the post of uh, divisional commissioner and very very intelligent uh, he has written quite a few books so he was a polymath and same with dadamai nawroji <coughs> so i have read Ro- i haven't read dadamai nawroji's books but i have read romesh chandra dutt's books rc dutt's books especially on the economic history of india and famines in india so brilliant set of three books you can download them for free from internet archive so the concept of the drain of wealth uh, it seems very simple at least to my mind so it's basically you know the british took a vacuum cleaner and cleaned up all our wealth and left us beggars but when um you know rc dutt or dadamai navroji or even utsa patnaik speak of the con- drain of wealth they are talking about one specific portion of the money that was drained out so it's not the whole amount which is why i keep harping in every episode that 45 trillion is just a portion of the total wealth funnel out of india <clears throat> so we'll understand what this particular um, definition of drain of wealth is <clears throat> so there are two definitions so again these are both derived from utsa patnaik's book and they are definition and explanations of as well so one definition or explanation of the drain is so one third of total tax and revenues was not spent in normal way within the country but set aside for sterling expenditure by britain on its own account abroad now what this basically means is so the money which was taken out of india in terms of tax or revenues so there were two british administrations one was the ad- british administration in india and one was what used to be called the mother country so was britain so the british administration in india was pretty much given full leeway to control and occu- occupy and do what they wanted with the country as long as it didn't cause any problems to the mother country so the british administration in india collected all this revenue and what this definition says is one third or 33% of the total tax and revenues was used by britain by the mother country uh, you know the present day united kingdom for its own purposes so to invest in other countries uh, so it could get a nice return on investment to invest in its own inf- infrastructure but that 33% was not used for the benefit of indians okay so that's one uh, kind of uh, perspective of the drain of wealth the second one is the system of getting goods free as the commodity equivalent of economic surplus extracted as taxes was the essence of the drain of the transfer so this is from professor utsa patnaik's book and i'm just quoting verbatim so what this means is especially in the beginning the east india company bought goods from indian merchants tradesmen farmers producers etc and they taxed them at the same time and the merchants were you know or the indian producers farmers were paid from their own taxes so basically they were not earning anything so everything was going in the company's pockets and this was continued even in later times till the end of british rule in a more sophist- sophisticated form okay so these two things basically combine to form uh, you know a definition of what is known as the drain of wealth again you know as as i like to emphasize this particular uh, concept only covers a part of the money funnel from india so 45 trillion is a very small part okay so i have knocked out uh, this figure based on my notes which i took while reading uh, professor patnaik's article 
and it looks a little convoluted so it's not a very great diagram but uh, i think it will do the trick so so in the box on the left hand side we have got indian farmers and producers and the british occupation in india or you know, the administration the vice viceroys etc so they took took money in the form of taxes and the indian farmers were paid for whatever you know uh, they sold again from their own taxes so that from money so like i said this arrangement was quite 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 simplistic in the times of the east india company but this continued in a more sophisticated form so the indian farmers or producers weren't really earning anything more so and again if you look at my articles on videos on the british revenue extortion you will see that the incomes were actually in the negative okay so but then this brings us to a question so indian farmers and producers so india was one of the largest exporters of raw material agricultural goods you know cotton etc for most of the 19th century so what happened to all this surplus because india was exporting more than it was importing from britain so obviously in economic terms this means a uh, britain ran a current account deficit from with india which means that uh, britain was exporting more than it was sending to india so it owed india money rather than the other way around <coughs> so what britain did till 1833 is you know all goods from india had to be first transshipped to britain to uk and they had to be uh, transported on ships uh, commanded by british officers okay and all of these goods were then re-exported to different places europe uh, usa you know china etc etc and a 15% markup was added on to this so britain was kind of you know having the milk and the cream so do then malai as well because what was happening till 1833 was the east india company like i said was taxing you know indians uh, it started with bengal and obviously as the company rule spread so they started taxing more and more regions in india so they were taxing the people and they would have another representative who would actually act as a buyer now there was no link between the person who was collecting the taxes and the person who was actually buying the goods but the people the indians were getting paid from their own taxes so it was negative income they weren't making anything so for britain this was very cozy arrangement now after 1833 what happened was Uh, the indian markets were opened up to british dumping and you know taxes on indian goods being exported especially the finished goods were punched up to 200% 100% something like that so they basically were killing off the domestic industry so they had to now come to a different scenario where they had to continue the same arrangement of extracting the money but they had to do it a bit more cleverly so from after 1833 the goods were shipped directly from india to different ports around the world but even before 1833 and after 1833 one thing that always remained common till the end of the empire was revenue from indian exports were first collected in britain or the mother country okay so what actually came to the indian farmers producers hands because you know they ran a surplus so for their cost of production they weren't getting paid anything extra they were just getting paid a per portion from the taxes so what was happening to the profit you know india ran a such a massive surplus so britain came up with a very innovative way of dealing with the profit and so here i have again knocked up a very uh, basic figure so this shows how this was balanced so it became very unfavorable to india okay so what the british government did and of uh, obviously the british administration in india put it into practice so every time india ran or did not run an export surplus because in all years you know if there was an economic slump then the india wouldn't be running an export surplus because the demand for the goods and raw materials would fall like all across the world so irrespective of whether india had a high export surplus or didn't have a export surplus every year from india <coughs> there used to be a demand for money from britain known as under different headings so this was known as home charges 
so this was the expenditure of maintaining india from britain so these were the home charges then there were gifts to britain so these were uh, random amounts of money doled out uh, and one example is you know after the first world war 100 million pounds was given as gift from india to britain obviously no indian had any idea of this gift so this was their way of adjusting for the surplus profit which was being collected in britain so this could because accounting is all about you know kind of numbers on paper essentially so this was all kind of balancing the numbers on paper so india would look to be in perennial in debt to britain and india was made to pay everything was built to india's account so i'll just show you on the next slide okay so we'll just go back so opium wars 1857 so the suppression and the genocide of indians after 1857 that was built to india's account the transfer of the east india company to the british crown built to india's account afghan wars and this continued wars in africa uh, infrastructure so particularly the telegraph lines railways everything was built to india's account and the british companies were guaranteed a dividend and they could take unlimited dividends out dividends out of india so this was literally strip mining of india in progress plus what happened was now because all of this was piled on even in times when india did not have a profit or an export surplus this naturally created a debt so india instead of britain being the debt debtor to india india became the debtor to the british and obviously on this debt you they piled on interest uh, so a lot of these payments were then interest payments so we were being charged for money we never owed in the first place whereas the british owed us that money <coughs> so this is again you know i've just modified this diagram so you can see the home charges gifts interest and payments were funneled by the british occupation in india to the mother country and that was how this game kind of went on so again a little bit of a simplistic presentation based on my understanding of the article but i think this will do for the time being so we were built for everything and in this slide you know i got an image of the opium war in china so they grew they forced indian farmers to grow opium and then they for forced the chinese to consume the opium <coughs> and the cost of this opium war was built on india's account then in this um, kind of image you got uh, the red line so these were the undersea telegraph cables connecting the british with their you know occupied uh, kind of countries over the world and the cost of this big kind of trans uh, you know ocean cable was actually charged onto india's account especially the one which ran from <coughs> london right up to <coughs> you know cape town and then went up to the islands and up to india so this was all charged to india's account no wonder you know britain never had a deficit so even in the wars with napoleon uh, between 1800 and 1810 they were actually in a surplus because they were getting bankrupt for free so it was all just free money for them <clears throat> and another consequence of this was which is why colonial repartitions are very important and we need to raise this demand <clears throat> so in this uh, map i've shown the red line to indicate the flow of wealth from india to the uk and these green lines indicate the british investment to different anglo-saxon countries especially so of north america so the usa canada and australia new zealand so entire infrastructure railways roads factories in all these countries were <coughs> excuse me were completely based on the money funneled out of india so when india raises the demand for colonial repartitions so all of these countries will have to be made party to this because they were all party to the loot of wealth from india directly or indirectly okay friends so that's all for this time so in the next part of this series i will start looking at each of the time periods divided by you know professor utsapatnaik and the first is the east india company and the drain of wealth so thank you for watching i hope you like this video if you did like please remember to like share and subscribe and i will see you next time thank you